Oh man, Isaiah chapter 11, if you have a Bible, go ahead and flip to it, uh, kind of in the middle there. Um, so again, if, uh, if you're like, where is it, just kind of put your thumbs in the middle and open up and you'll be really close. Uh, if you hit the Psalms, go to your right a bit, if you hit uh, Jeremiah or if you go back to Jonah, again, go left again. Um, but Isaiah chapter 11 is, is where we are going to be um, Let's read it, um, the whole chapter, and then uh, we'll talk about it for a bit. Isaiah 11, the prophet Isaiah writes, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people. From Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and will wave his hand over the river with his scorching breath, and strike it into seven channels. And he will lead people across in sandals. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people, and as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together and ask God to speak to us through it. Holy God, there are many voices that we can hear today and listen to. We're all having a conversation with ourselves throughout the day. We've got news outlets and friends and family and social media telling us, telling us all kinds of things that... um, that may appear to be right, and maybe they are, God, I don't know. But what we know is that your word is true and it never fails. It's always right. And so would you speak to us today and let us hear your voice. I want to invite you to take a second before we continue, and would you just pray and ask God to speak to you, directly to you. God, speak through me for your glory and for the good of your church. In Christ we pray and we ask. Amen. Um, One of the most, I think, desired, um, I don't want to say gifts because it's not really as tangible, but gifts of Christmas is peace. I I think most people, I mean, we sing enough songs about it, it's it's, it's everywhere. Like I think most people, it's universally a desired, you know, desired thing is peace, but especially around Christmas, I believe that. Uh, that we think about peace a lot more often. Um, our, my two of my daughters are in elementary, and they do a celebrations program um, every every Christmas time. 
in which each like grade level celebrates a different uh, holiday. And so like they'll celebrate, one grade will you know, celebrate Hanukkah and another Christmas and another Las Posadas and another Kwanzaa and another Chinese New Year. And it's, it's this way for the school to come together and just say like, we celebrate all, all walks of life and all peoples and everybody's welcomed. And then, and then they all come together at the end and everybody comes out and they hold hands and they invite parents to stand and sing. And I don't ever know what the lyrics are. And so I'm like, okay, uh, cool. But uh, they, they conclude this celebrations of all different you know, faiths and, and traditions with the song, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And so they're, they're kind of tying a, a bow on this presentation and saying like, okay, you're over there and you're over there and you're over here and you're over here. Let's all have peace together. B- because whether you celebrate Kwanzaa or Christmas or, or Hanukkah, uh, like uh, peace is a universal desire, right? Everybody longs for peace. Christmas, man, you can get everything on your wish list, but if there's a lack of peace, it's really not even that great, right? Like, it's just not even, it's, you're miserable. And, and so everybody is, is longing for peace, and yet we all know unrest at the same time. We all know, know different areas of brokenness, and we all um, have tasted that in our lives. Um, and, and, and what I, I see in, in the Bible and what God tells us is that his desire for you is peace, his desire for you is, is rest. God's will is not for, for brokenness. God's will for you is not for unrest. God's will for you, his desire for you today is peace. Remember in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you would have life and have it abundantly. That is his desire for us. Whatever is happening in your life today, his desire for you is peace. It is rest. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That that God's desire and his gift is peace. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Shalom. Like, even just the sound of that word sounds, like, I don't know, it just sounds peaceful to me. Shalom. It's this, it's this idea of wholeness, of rest, that you're not anxious and worried and troubled, that you're not, you're not looking over your shoulder and hustling and afraid, that there's just this shalom, this peace, this rest. That's the Hebrew word for it, and that was God's original design for humanity was this universal world of shalom, where, where God and mankind walked together. They had a, a relationship of love and peace together, and, and humans had a relationship of peace together, and, and the relationship between mankind and the literal earth was, was peaceful. Like that was God's original design, that we would walk in his presence, and because we're in his presence, we would know Peace, like a real shalom. And then it, it didn't take long for that to be broken, right? It didn't take long for Adam and Eve to, to lead the way just like you and I have followed, which is to take their eyes off of God and to choose to do their own thing. That's the heart of sin. That's the, that's the battle that is within each of us today. Is It's what Rosie read. Am I going to trust in the way of the Lord? Am I going to trust in what is, is, is wise to him? Or am I going to look around me and am I going to determine what's best? Am I going to determine the right way to go? Am I going to walk by what makes sense in my mind, in my eyes? And, and in so doing, what we see from Genesis 3 on is that when we choose our way, we separate ourselves from the fellowship and the peace of God. That, that is what we see from Genesis 3 through the rest of the Bible is that it is our choice of going our own way, of choosing what makes sense to us, that separates us from God, that removes us from his presence, the presence of peace, of shalom. And yet in Genesis 3 and what we'll see in, in the Bible is that God moves near. I mean, if, if I could just, I don't know, maybe I'll do this one day, if I could just like have a sheet of like, okay, top few things that I would love to teach this church as, as God allows me to be uh, one of the pastors, this is one of the truths that I would teach, is that God moves near. 
is that when I am actively opposing him, God in an incredible love is moving near to me. The offended is moving near to the offender. I I don't know about y'all, that's really difficult for me to do with people. You offend me, my natural reaction isn't, let me lean into you, right? You, You hurt me, my natural reaction isn't, how can I move near to you in love? How can I bless you and serve you and care for you? Anyone else as, as self, self-protective as me? I, I'm going to assume, okay, cool. I'm not, the only, I'm not the only selfish one. Great. Yet God moves near to the ones who are actively opposing him. He moves near. Listen, today at 10.32 a.m. on December the 15th, God is moving near to you. Right here, right now. He's not just a God who was alive in Genesis or Isaiah. He's a God who is alive today and by his spirit is moving near to you and, and to me. My prayer is that we will, in humility, Receive his grace. And not stubbornly and pridefully continue to walk away. This God of peace, he's moving near. He never relents. He never lets up. Praise God that he has patience. He's moving near. We we see this in in Genesis 3, when, when God begins to, to work to restore that relationship that was broken, in Genesis 6, God begins to make promises to mankind. With Noah, he begins to make these promises. He gives his word that he will fix what was broken, that, that he will move near and fix what was broken. So he makes this promise to, to Noah, and then he makes a promise to Abraham that he's going to continue to build this people to restore broken humanity back to him. And then he makes a promise with Moses and Israel. And then he makes a promise with David. And he's making these promises that he's going to come and to fix that, that brokenness, that, that unrest. He's going to fix that. And he promises that he's going to do it. And yet none of those people lived up to their end of the bargain. Not, not Noah, not Abraham, not Moses, not David. All of these like pillars of the faith, man. These people that were like, gosh, they, they did it. None of them actually lived up to their end of the bargain. And so God promises, he says, I'm going to send someone who will live up to that end of the bargain. On behalf of humanity, someone is going to come who's going to be a better Noah and a better Abraham and a better Moses and a better David. And that someone is going to live up to his end of the covenant and he's going to lead the way for us to be restored into a relationship with God because he's going to get it right. And so we see that in the Old Testament where God is saying that he's going to fix what is broken. He's going to complete his promise. And one day someone is going to come to stand and finally do for humanity what no one else has done. Isaiah 9, the the prophet Isaiah speaks of him. He says in verse 6 of this this one who will come one day. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah 9 says there's coming a prince of peace and of his rule the peace will never end. It will never stop. And then we get to Isaiah 11 and it talks more about this, this coming one. In Isaiah 11, there's not peace. The the context of Isaiah 11 is incredible unrest. Israel has been overtaken by Assyria. Uh, There's war and calamity and death and heartache and brokenness. There's not peace happening in the life of Israel when we get to Isaiah chapter 11. It's incredibly restless. 
And yet God says through Isaiah in verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. The, the prophecy is saying that there's going from, from the family tree of Jesse is going to come eventually one under the, that tree that, that is going to bear good fruit. That, that is going to produce good fruit. Fruit. The, Jesse was the father of King David. 2 Samuel 7, God told David, hey, I'm going to send someone in your family tree, in the family tree of Jesse, that one day will establish a kingdom that will never end. And so Isaiah 11 is talking about that prophecy that God made to David. That under his family tree, under the family tree of Jesse, will come someone that will establish a kingdom that will never end. There, there's quite a, a contrast in Isaiah 11, verse 1, to Isaiah 10, verse 33 and 34. So if you look back a couple verses, it says, Behold, the Lord God of hosts will, will lop the bows with terrifying power. The great and the height will be hewn down, and the lofty will be brought low. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe, and Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. Those are words that we never use in our conversations today. I can't remember the last time I, I used the word lop. Um, in, in a conversation, I don't know about you, um, what he is saying, God is saying that it, Assyria has come and they've taken over Israel and they're proud and they're mighty and they're big and God is going to chop them down. That these boastful, arrogant trees of Assyria, God is going to come in and chop them down and then from the lowly ground, the stump of Jesse, God is going to bring a little shoot up a little branch that's going to start small. That the big and mighty God is going to bring low, but the lowly God is going to lift up. And so what we see in the comparison of Assyria and then of the, the, the shoot, the branch that comes from Jesse, is what we see throughout the Bible that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That the kingdom of this coming king is going to be marked by humility. That for the one who stands tall in his own ways, for the one who, who's prideful in his own ways, God will actively oppose them and bring them low. But for the one who is humble before the Lord, God will give grace and lift up. It's impossible for peace to reign where pride leads the way. That's what's happening in Isaiah 10. Pride is leading the way from Assyria and God is saying, no, 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 no. There's no peace there. Pride is the exaltation of self. Pride thinks of self first. Pride, pride seeks to have the status and position of God. It's impossible to be in fellowship with God when trying to take his seat on the throne. It's impossible to move near to God when trying to go our own way. And if God is the God of peace, then it's impossible to have the peace of God when standing in pride. So often I think we wonder, like, why is there so much unrest? And I think a question we have to ask, it may, may not be the answer, but a question we have to ask is, am I standing in pride in anywhere in my life? Because if pride is leading the way, it's impossible to move near and be in fellowship with God. It's in direct opposition to who he is. And so we're not going to have peace. Andrew Murray in his book, we've talked about this book a ton. Um, it's creatively titled Humility. Um, in his book, he says, pride is the poison of hell. Gosh, that phrase stuck with me. The poison of of hell. It makes sense that if I've got the poison of hell running in me, I'm going to have a hard time walking in the peaceful fellowship of God. Right? That's what Assyria is. They're, they're prideful and God says, no, 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 no. There's only one here. I'm going to go ahead and take you out. But then it's this, this shoot of Jesse, this branch of Jesse that starts small that God says, and that's the one I'm going to lift up. The humble I lift up, the humble I give grace to. And so this coming king is marked by humility, and the fruit of his tree is humility. The fruit that will come of this king is 
humility. And this new king will be perfectly qualified to lead the way because he will have the very spirit of the Lord God on him. That's what verse 2 says, the spirit of the Lord. You see, look in your Bibles. Is that word Lord there in all caps? I th- it should be, right? Like, yes, little, little, yes, all caps, right? In verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord. Just, okay, perfect. All right, I think that I'm, I'm making sure that I'm, like, we're, okay. So when you see the word Lord in all caps, that is the Hebrew word Yahweh. It's different than the word Lord that's capital L, lowercase o-r-d. That is the word Adonai. So, so when you see all caps Lord, that's the word Yahweh, and Hebrews would not write that word out. God is too holy to write out the name Yahweh. And so they would just write the consonants of the, of the word Yahweh, and the English translation then said, okay, this is Lord, let's make sure that everybody knows it's talking about Yahweh and put it in all caps. And so when you see this, the spirit of Yahweh, the one true God, the, the Lord that is no other, there's none like him, the spirit of God himself shall rest upon this king. The spirit of God himself, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit and of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This king that Isaiah 11 says is coming will have everything he needs to perfectly lead because the spirit of the Lord Yahweh is on him. And so he's got everything he needs to walk in perfect leadership and perfect humility and perfect obedience. And then look at verse 3. His delight, his joy, his happiness, what makes this king happy is the fear of the Lord. That's not, the, the word fear there is not talking like tremble, scare, like, oh no, I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed. The, that's, a, that's an awe. That's when you stand in front of a mountain range and you just go, how is this possible, right? W- when you look over the, the Grand Canyon or you're, you're on the ocean and there's just a sunset and all you just see is water and you just kind of go, man, this is, in, like, this is incredible, that, that's, that's awe, that's fear, that's majesty. That's just a, a proper positioning when we realize I am not that big. There's something greater than me. And so for this king, the fear of the Lord, the awe of God, the worship of God is his delight and joy. As humans, we are all created to look for pleasure and happiness. We've been saying that from the beginning of Austin Life, that every single one of us is looking to make the most out of life. Like, no one wants to walk through life miserable. No one. Not a single person. We're all making choices that we think are ultimately going to make us happy. That we think are the best options, the best possible things. Like, this is going to give me the most pleasure. Even sometimes when we know, like, this is stupid, For whatever reason, we think it's going to give us the most pleasure in that moment, and so we do it. And then we go, gosh, that was dumb. Because that's how we're created. What this king is saying is that his joy and delight is always in worshiping God. Always. That is where his joy and pleasure comes. Everything else we chase after will leave us disappointed and hurt. Come on, we can all make that list, right? We can all talk through the things that we try to find joy and happiness in only to wake up and go, dang, that really kind of let me down. Like I thought this was going to be it and it's a good thing, but it really kind of, I'm still wanting more. I'm still disappointed here. Because nothing else is created to carry the full weight and capacity of our joy in our hearts. And so this king is saying there's one thing, one thing that will make my delight and my joy and it is in the Lord. It's a posture of humility, of worshiping God. So there's two things that we see here about this king. And these two things are what determine how he lives. One, that the spirit of the Lord is on him. And two, that his joy is in humility. His joy is in the fear of God. His joy is in worshiping God. The spirit of the Lord is on him. And he's got the humility of that lifts God high above all else, and that is what results in the character of his life, which is righteousness and faithfulness. That's what he says, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears 
here, man, come on, how many times do we make decisions based on what we can see and what makes sense in our head? Oh, my gosh. Oh, it's gross. I'm just thinking about my own life. I'm like, but he's not going to make decisions based on what he can see and what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor. Decide with equity for the meek. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. What he's saying is that truth, only truth, will come out of his mouth. And truth, man, it comes hard at the wicked, right? Only truth is what is going to come out of his mouth. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. At the core of who this king is, is rightness, is faithfulness, is doing the right thing. Thing over and over and over and over again. So we have this king who's always going to do the right thing. And the way he's always going to do the right thing is that he has the spirit of God on him. And he's got a posture of humility. And that em- enables him and compels him to be righteous. Does that make sense? He's got the power of God in him and the heart posture that says God is greater than everything else and so because he is enabled and empowered and he wants God to be honored above all else he's always going to do the right thing he's always going to be faithful that is the king that is coming that is the king that Isaiah 11 is looking forward to if you're starting to ask like okay Isaiah 11 who is this king and I'm guessing at this point you, you probably know the answer here um so it's Jesus. If, if, you're, if you're wondering, like, okay, who is this coming king? It's, it's Jesus. In Luke 4, Jesus goes into the synagogue. He goes into church, and he opens up the scroll, it says in, in, in Luke 4, chapter, or verse 17. And he opens up to the prophet Isaiah. And he finds the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Right? We've got, we got some connection happening here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. And then in verse 20, he rolls it up. He gives it back and all the eyes were on him. And then verse 21, I don't think I actually gave this to y'all, sorry guys. Verse 21, it says, Jesus says, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus opens up Isaiah and he says, hey, the, the one that Isaiah talked about coming, hey, that's me. And it's been fulfilled. I'm here. Jesus is this coming king where the spirit of God rests on him and his heart posture is always to do the will of God. Therefore, he lives righteous and faithfully. He is the king that Isaiah 11 is talking about. Then we get to see some characteristics of this kingdom. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Those two don't go together, right? Like that's not how it's supposed to be. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. I don't know how many leopards you know. I don't know if you've run into many leopards, but they typically don't hang out with goats. That doesn't go well for the goat, right? Like that's going to end poorly. The leopard's going to be good. The goat, not so much calf and the lion, the, the cow and the bear, the, the nursing child shall, shall play over the hole of the cobra. Look, I, I, the, I know that a lot of you aren't parents yet, but I have a, a sneaky feeling that if you saw a child playing around a snake, like you would think, that's not a good situation. Like something's not right there. But, but it's okay because verse 9 says, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. The The characteristic of the kingdom of this king is one of radical peace. It is the the characteristic of the kingdom of this king is one of supernatural peace. Where two things that should not go together because of this king now go together. Where, Where we can love our enemies. Where we can serve those who oppress us where we can forgive when we've been wronged. The markings of this king and of this kingdom and of those within that kingdom is of supernatural peace. The wrongs are made right. Down is flipped back up. The dark is brought into lightness. Where there's restlessness, peace 
intercedes and takes over. It's the characteristics of this kingdom. Some have asked, okay, is this a literal, like should we interpret this literally like, like a wolf with a lamb? And, or is it figurative? Best I can read from the Bible and from smarter people than me, it's, it's both. It's both. We live in what people call the already not yet. That when Jesus came into this world, his kingdom already came into this world, but it's not yet complete. So with Jesus is the ability for this peace to happen. With Jesus is the possibility for this supernatural radical peace where you think that there can't be reconciliation here. By Jesus, that's made possible. And it's made possible because he came and he lived up to the expectation that Noah had and that Abraham had and that Moses had and that David had and none of them lived up to it. Jesus came and he lived up to it. And then he died on the cross and he took the full weight of sin and he overcame it all. He conquered the thing that brings unrest into our lives. Jesus overcame it. And and then none of this matters if he's still dead. Like, let, let's not just focus on the cross. Let's also focus on the fact that Jesus came off that cross, was put in a tomb, and then three days later came back to life and is alive today. If that doesn't happen, none of this matters. Let's pack it up. Let's sleep in on Sundays, and let's do something different. No. Good news, though. He's alive, so it does matter. Jesus enabled this supernatural peace. You and I should have no place in the presence of God. This holy, righteous, perfect God. And then you and I, Isaiah says that our best days are filthy rags in his presence. Man, we walk up and we're like, God, I killed it today. And he's so holy, he's disgusted at our best days. Because he's just so holy, right? He's just so perfect that even our best days are tarred and tainted with selfishness and right and so we have no right to be in his presence and yet the peace of Jesus comes in and reconciles two parties that should never be together he brings that peace and he says hey you are the sinner and the offender God is the offended I'm going to reconcile y'all together I'm going to bring us back into relationship with God. That's what Jesus brings. That's the kingdom that Jesus brings. And so then we look at it and we're like, okay, there is a supernatural peace that Jesus brings, but I'm still not going to let my kids play around a snake. And that's because the kingdom's not yet complete. But one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to complete what he began. And sin and the power of brokenness will completely be abolished forever into the depths of hell. And God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth where I believe animals and humans and everything are going to come together. And where we used to go, that's a bad situation because it's nothing but the peace of God on earth and in heaven. It's not a bad situation anymore. That's the not yet that we look forward to coming. That one day, everything will be made right. Everything. And yeah, I think that we're going to look at the lion and the lamb hanging out together. Because death is no more, and hurt is no more, and brokenness is no more, and abuse is no more, and there's no predator and prey. It's just the peace of Jesus reigning over everything. That day is coming, but don't miss it today. Because his power is still alive today. There's still the ability because of Jesus in us to have that peace today. Don't miss it. Keep your eyes looking ahead, but don't miss what he's got today as well. So I think it's both. But I think the the way of the king and the marks of the kingdom is radical supernatural peace. Let's just be honest, if if peace isn't ruling in our lives, then we're not not demonstrating the way of the kingdom very well. But that's not his his will for us. That's not his desire. We don't have to stay there. We don't. And and that doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. Let me be clear with that. That doesn't mean like, oh, man, I was sick, but now I'm not going to be sick anymore. And we still may be sick. It doesn't mean that everything's just going to go easy, it, but it means that there's a contentment and a peace beneath it all that trumps everything else. 
It's greater than everything else. That's why Paul in prison can say, I rejoice in all things. I'm content in all circumstances. Whether I have food or no food, I'm content because Christ is enough. So it doesn't mean that our circumstances are necessarily easy. It just means that the presence of Christ is greater than our circumstances. And so in the midst of those storms, we can still have peace. Does, it, does that make sense? I want to make, make sure to not, I want to preach both sides of it. So who's this for? This, this kingdom that's coming, who's, who's it for? Verse 11 and 12, we won't go through all of the different names again. I mean, it just says that in, in the day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnants of his people. And in verse 12, he's, he's raising a signal for the nations. He's gathering to disperse from the four corners of the earth. It, what God is saying is that all people in all places will be open to this invitation of peace. North, south, east, west, everybody in between, this, this kingdom of peace will be made available through Jesus. He's going to open up a highway to bring back those who have been lost. Y'all, that's, that's really good news for us. Be, because, because we live in what I think the Bible would say, like, is the four corners of the earth. We're, we're not living in Israel. We're not, like... We're, we live in the far off places of the world that the Bible would look at. And so praise God that he opened up the highway to all places of the world because that then invites us in. That, that includes us, the, the Gentile, the, the ones far from him. That He welcomes us in and invites us in. And by faith in Christ, he makes that possible so that today you and I can have the peace that God brings. And we can have the peace of one another and our lives can be transformed and we can see Miracles done that we never saw possible. One of the stories that I think is just an incredible picture of this um, is uh, with, with Aaron Moore. I don't know if y'all know Aaron Moore um, and, and Austin Moore. I, I, in my mind, when you, if you just see Aaron Moore and, and Austin Walking down the street, you'd never think like, okay, in Christ, these two can be really good friends. And yet, it's Jesus that has united these two to be incredible friends. And we've got a, we've got a little video of, of their story, just a brief bit of it um, that I wanted to show.
Man, that, that, that's, that's just, look, I, I, I just don't think culture and society would look at those two people and be like, hey, y'all should be friends. But, but in Christ, it says we're brothers and um, Christ unites people that you wouldn't normally see being united. Um, we got a text this morning from Austin. Uh, Austin is, uh, Aaron's been in the hospital for a little over a week now. Uh, he's having some stomach pains. And, um, and they found a blockage in his intestinal tract, and so they were supposed to have surgery uh, to remove it. Um, and then Austin texted us this morning that the doctors determined the surgery uh, would be too intense um, and, and could pose further problems. And so uh, they're, they're not doing the surgery anymore. And so Aaron is uh, understandably discouraged and unsure of what's next. Uh, they're discussing uh, hospice care as a possibility um, So um, let's just pr- let's pray for Aaron. Uh, let's pray for his his healing. Uh, God, is, God is able. He's able, uh, and so let's in faith pray for Aaron and for God to heal him and to use his life for His glory. God in heaven, we read in your word, we see of your ability, your faithfulness to um, walk with us and to not leave us alone. We see of your power and of your ability to heal. And God, I admit my faith is um, small. but I believe that what's there honors, I believe that the faith we have honors you. And so in faith, we pray and ask for Aaron's healing. God, you created the body, you designed the um, insides, you understand everything. Um, If anybody can undo, turn back, it's you. So would you heal him? Would you set his eyes and his mind on you that he would find um, a peace and comfort from you, the God of comfort, the Prince of Peace? That's what we ask together. In the name of Jesus, we believe you hear us. We believe that you will answer with what is best. Amen. Listen, y'all, as we wrap up, uh, Jesus is the king that Isaiah 11 was talking about. He was empowered by the Spirit of God, and he was marked by humility, and that is what enabled him and compelled him to walk in righteousness and faithfulness. We're invited into a relationship with him. God has opened up the highway. He's invited all. Anyone and everyone has an invitation to come to God, but that invitation is not to come to God and still be our own God. It's to lay our lives down and surrender to him and to relinquish control of our lives in in place of him being in control. And when in faith we do that, Jesus removes our sin and in its place gives us his righteousness so that we can be restored to relationship with God. And then 1 John 2, man, I've been been hanging out in 1 John a lot. Um, 1 John 2, it says that whoever says, I know him, 
So whoever says, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, and in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him, in Jesus. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If Jesus is your king, then our, our call and our responsibility is to walk in the footsteps of our king. Is to walk in the same way that he walked, and he walked in righteousness and faithfulness. And here's the great news, is that the same Spirit of God that rested on Jesus is the same Spirit of God that rests in us if we, by faith, have trusted Christ. We have the same power that Jesus had to walk in righteousness and faithfulness. The question is, will we put on the posture of humility that Jesus did, and may the fear of God be our delight and joy, or will we seek to find happiness in something else? We trusted Christ, we have the Spirit of God in us. The question then becomes our own humility before the Lord. If we have the Spirit of God and the humility of God, we will walk in righteousness and faithfulness just as Jesus walked. It's there for us. He's invited us in to his glory, to the good of those around us. That is the invitation and call. And in those footsteps is the peace of his kingdom. Pray that we will know that peace experientially by his power, by his humility. We'll walk in it just as he walked.